today's world, we're supported by a multitude of virtual assistants. Maybe your calendar app has just reminded you to join this presentation, or a trading bot closed some lucrative deals overnight without your supervision. But surprisingly few physical autonomous systems are around us in everyday life. In my thesis, optimization and learning algorithms the dynamic locomotion of walking robots, I'm trying to shed some light on the difficulties that keep us back and propose some specific advances towards deploying robots in real world scenarios. The place where we do historically find a lot of robots are factories, in, particularly in, the motor, in particular in the automotive industry. But those are heavy and dangerous machines precisely pre-programmed where to move. The trend has been going towards more mobile systems with a larger workspace that can work alongside humans. But even as they encounter a small irregularity, they require our supervision. And this is not even speaking of leaving this structured environment, for example, through, go through a flight of stairs to venture outdoors. This is where we think leg robots will come in. For example, this quadrupedal robot animal. If their versatility and superior locomotion capabilities, we think they're promising tasks for many realistic, unstructured scenarios. For example, going down the slippery pathway here, crossing over a gap where wheeled robots would have troubles, or wander off into remote areas where we don't know what to expect. What keeps us back from deploying robots in large numbers in those places is our ability to create intelligent control solutions, such that those machines could operate autonomously. In an underground challenge of creating intelligent autonomous systems, I'm focusing on a small subpart of this problem, which is the motion and planning, motion planning and control problem over a limited horizon of a few meters or seconds ahead. What's delicate about leg robots in particular is the fact that we have to control many degrees of freedom at the same time, decide where to step and keep stability of the system. This is not something you would like to do manually. So a lot of methods have been proposed in the path that tackle this problem. So many that there are way too many to focus on in a single presentation. So what I'll be looking on specifically is a group of algorithms between optimal control and data-driven methods. Optimal control has proven successful for such applications in the past because it assumes a holistic viewpoint on the entire control problem rather than hand engineering separate components. It also generalizes to different tasks and systems, and importantly, allows us to respect the constraints of the system and the environment, which we'll see later will become important for hardware transfer. Now, our methods in this work are based mainly on optimal control and then augmented with machine learning techniques to address some of the shortcomings. And because optimal control is a very recurring pattern in this presentation, I want to quickly introduce you the optimal control problem. This problem tries to formulate the control problem as a mathematical optimization, which has two main parts. First, the cost function, where this first term, the final cost, for example, penalizes how far, how far we are away from the goal at the end of our path. And this integral term sums up the cost that we have spent along the path, for example, the energy. Then below, there are a number of constraints, the most important of which is the dynamics constraint, which forces the solution to be realistically, physically feasible, such that we can deploy this on the real system. Now, usually now this is solved repetitive, repetitively, such that we always have an up-to-date motion plan. And while this now sounds mathematically elegant, if we could actually formulate and solve it for all the problems that I've shown you on the first slide, then most of the people in this room will probably not have a job anymore. But we face some practical challenges. And I want to illuminate those in the form of a comparison between a simpler system, this ball balancing robot on the left-hand side, and our quadrupedal robot. I've identified three main challenges of optimal control. The first one is modeling. So compared to just modeling a single body, for a walking robot, we have many more bodies, much more complex dynamics, therefore, and importantly, more constraints due to the way how the system interacts with the environment through contacts, making it a hybrid system. Second problem is exploration. Since most methods are relying on gradient-based optimization, they're prone to getting stuck in local minima. And for walking robots, we have way, many, way more of those, and they're harder to overcome. 
And finally, the last problem is computation. Because if we do real world deployment of, the, of those algorithms, we face hard real time constraints. And this can get quite computationally intense for high dimensional models. So in my thesis now, I will address those problems separately with a number of publications. In the first two works, I'm looking at a way how to model leg robots that is both accurate and non-restrictive, but still competitively fast. Then in the third work, I'll address the problem of exploration to avoid getting stuck in local minima and as a byproduct, get a more general modeling procedure. And finally, in the last two works, I will try to eliminate the computational bottleneck of optimal control by using machine learning tools. Now, my following talk will be structured along solving those three problems. First, I'll try to capture the full effects of contacts away from handcrafted simplifications such that we can reproduce what happens also on such slippery paths that you've seen earlier. Then I'll continue with the theme of using an accurate model and introduce stochasticity for exploration so that we can cross those discrete terrain patches you see in the picture. And finally, I will use machine learning to train a neural network that inherits the capabilities of the first two methods while only requiring a fraction of the computational, computa computational cost at runtime. Let me begin with the first one, modeling realistic scenarios. The most tricky part of modeling a legged system is usually the contacts. And this is what we focus on here. Contacts are characterized by something called a complementarity condition, which means that either the contact is open and this gap function is positive, or the contact is closed. And then the normal component of the contact force acts only repulsively or positive. But none of those, none of those conditions can happen at the same time. And since most solvers decide on both the gap function and the force at the same time, they are forced with this difficult non-convex constraint. And that forces them to, do a, to strike a number of trade-offs between the accuracy, speed, and convexity of the problem. Different options have been presented in the past to focus on one part of this trade-off more than the others, depending on the task. But we were not satisfied with either of these because either the models were too restrictive or too slow. So in the realistic scenarios that we want to model, we want to have an accuracy that includes the friction effects. It's not restrictive for the kinds of motions that we can produce with it, but still remain fast. And we will defer the convexity a little bit to the second method in this thesis. So the solution that we found was inspired from physics simulators, which compute the interaction force as a function of the state and inputs of the system. And we transferred this idea to the optimal control problem, where rather than enforcing the constraints at the level of the optimization, we folded them into the dynamics. And this is possible through something called morose time stepping, which is an accurate way of representing the effects of contacts inside the system dynamics. Doing so is particularly promising or convenient if you combine it with a gradient-based shooting method, the details of which are not in entirely important at this point, but it guarantees us that we generate feasible motion plans with respect to this constraint up there and have a computational complexity that is linear in the time horizon. So what we'll get from that is an algorithm that can decide between the gate sequence, foot placement, and whole body motion. So we subjected this to two robots. Here on the left-hand side, you see a single leg topper, which we asked to go multiple distances forward. And this algorithm now comes up with emerging stepping behaviors that have the right number of steps, rather than pre-specifying the sequence, to reach the goal. We then scaled this to the full model of a quadruped, which is where we are capable of optimizing more than a dozen steps. And this transfers to the actual hardware, where we can repeat those motions very accurately. The reason why this transfers so well becomes evident when we look at the plot of the contact forces, where we here show the difference between the measured and predicted ones, and they align very nicely. So this hardware transfer was made possible by having a very accurate model with a strong predictive power. Beyond now discovering those stepping motions, the unique feature of our model is that we have an accurate contact law in there, including the effects of slippage. <laughs> 
So when we subject now the robot to a slippery ground, then the behavior, when we ask it to go forward, changes entirely. And rather than coming up with a stepping motion, it strategically pushes itself across the floor in a form of skating motion by loading and unloading legs. So here we purposefully optimize oversliding contacts and adapt the behavior according to how the ground interacts with us. And this is quite a novelty because most methods so far could just optimize over open or closed contacts at best. So in a little sub summary, through our formulation of injecting the contact loss into the dynamics, we managed to achieve a great hardware transfer and see some new emerging motion patterns that make, it, make explicit use of this model. And all of this while remaining competitively fast with real-time MPC rates. So we can conclude that we've reached our goal of creating an accurate and fast model with minimal restrictions. But as I said earlier, we deferred the convexity problem. And in fact, this has become more of a problem because those dynamics are now harder to optimize over. And that now takes me to the second work. Having an accurate model is great for hardware transfer, but no use if you get stuck in optimizing over it. And this problem will now only become worse on discontinuous ground patches, like you see in the picture. So if we want to continue enjoying the benefits of this accurate model, we need a different kind of algorithm. And this is what this section is about. As an abstraction to this discrete stepping stone problem, consider this case here, where we want to move across a room around a number of obstacles. Your standard gradient-based solver would now suggest a shorter path. But this clearly is infeasible because it leads right through this round obstacle. You could apply some tricks now to push the solution back to the feasible space. But overall, it's pretty unlikely that you'll find a more straight, direct path on the other side of the obstacle. So what we do here instead is sample the space. And that is possible by adding a term to the dynamics, which leads to this exploration. And this term is driven by noise. So those random walks on the left-hand side will now sometimes crash, of course, in the obstacles. But some of them will also find a more direct path to the goal than what we had before. What we need to solve now to find the optimal controls is a stochastic optimal control problem, where rather than minimizing the cost deterministically, we have to do so in expectation. And the way we do this is through a two-stage algorithm, where the sampling on the left-hand side is the first stage, which we call forward pass. Then we take those samples and in the backward pass, compute the optimal controls. This is a rather complex formula given from path integral control, but you might recognize that it resembles a soft max operation, which means that rather than taking the inputs of the best sample, we average over the few best performing ones weighted according to their cost performance. Then once we have this input, we can pass it to our robot, the robot gives us a new state and we can repeat this loop in an MPC style fashion. Now, for the statistical estimation of those expectations in the backward pass, there are a number of options that have been developed in the past. What we will use here is simple Monte Carlo sampling, which effectively amounts to disturbing every joint of the robot with random noise, such that those paths on the left-hand side appear. We choose Monte Carlo sampling because it imposes minimal restrictions on how we model and simulate our system. So in this case, what we can do is simulate those random walks inside a physics simulator, which links us back to the first work of using accurate models. But in addition here, we are, have now much more freedom in modeling, for example, obstacles or uneven ground. And in fact, we're not only using a single simulator, but many of them, because we can compute all those rollouts in parallel. So if we now apply this naive Monte Carlo sampling on our system, then for this simpler system of the ball balancing robot, that works pretty well, even over a slightly uneven ground. But for animal, that's a complete failure. We just see shaking and crashing. The reason for this discrepancy is that in the ballbot case, the samples more or less proceed as we have imagined. But on the animal case, or the quadrupedal case, case, there are two problems that complicate this entire thing. First is dimensionality which effectively in this analogy, it means that we have to find a much smaller gap to get across to the goal. 
The second problem is instability, which makes the samples veer off to the sides rather than proceeding forward. And both of these lead to a high variance estimation of the Monte Carlo sampling, which makes sampling the system so hard. But there's good news, because we've developed a solution to both. We use constraints and guiding controls to tackle those problems. Now, I'll spend the next few slides to explain these concepts. Let me begin with the dimensionality issue. What we realized here is that while the system is high dimensional, the environment naturally constrains the solution, for example, through such contact loss that we've seen earlier. So rather than letting the samples crash into the obstacles or the constraints, we should have a better way of enforcing those constraints earlier. And we tried this on a simpler system. So for this two link robot arm, unconstrained samples of getting towards the goal might look something like this, those blue lines here. Now, if the environment imposes a constraint on us, for example, to only move along a straight line towards the goal, maybe otherwise we hit an obstacle, then just hoping that one of those blue lines will fulfill the constraint is very unrealistic, the probability going towards zero. But what we can do is enforce this constraint already during the sampling through a sort of projection approach that we've developed here, such that all the samples only explore in the manifold of this constraint. And this has a strong effect on the cost distribution of the samples, where you see the red constraint samples have a much lower variance. So effectively, we reduce the dimensionality of the sampling distribution, and we'll now try to apply this to the, to the animal case, where here we encode the gate and contact related constraints as constraints of the sampling. So how this looks like, is, for example, in a swing phase of one foot, we will constrain all the samples to lie on top of each other in the Z direction, so same up-down motion, but in the forward direction, they can explore how far to step. And this solves the dimensionality problem for our walking robot, where we have reduced the dimensionality sufficiently such that enough samples succeed and we can average them to a smooth motion. This transfers to hardware, where we can even walk robustly over a set of stones that we have not modeled in the problem before. So we find that constraints are an essential mechanism for reducing the sampling space of high dimensional walking robots. Let me now focus on the second part, the instability. There are really two problems to the story because on one hand, we have an unstable system and there's not much we can do about that. But we also are trying to do something almost impossible because we're sampling from the uncontrolled dynamics, which means we're hoping that just noise will magically drive us towards the goal. The solution, of course, is to use a different kind of sampling dynamics that includes this guiding controller, Pi. If we do this right, then this guiding controller can funnel or push all the samples in the right direction and have such that they have a much higher chance of succeeding. And this also has a clear effect on the distribution. So for the uncontrolled dynamics, zero input, all the samples are at the high end of the cost. Just adding a constant weight compensation input around which we sample gains us an order of magnitude improvement. And another order of magnitude can be gained by sampling around a time-bearing feed-forward optimized sequence. So you can say that feed-forward controls is a massive driver of improving the mean performance of the sampling. But it gets better because if we now also add feedback to handle instability, we can additionally reduce the variance of the sampling distribution. And this now solves also the instability problem. And we can return to the discontinuous ground because it is now easier to sample as we've shaped the distribution in those two ways. So the scenario how we model this is basically two platforms, a gap in between a number of discrete stepping stones. The samples for one foot trajectory now could look like this, where the guiding controls, this line in yellow, is blind and actually suggests to go beyond the next step. But the samples spread sufficiently and explore where to go down, such as some of them will hit the next stone. So they probe effectively the environment. And when we see this in action, we can see those black dots are the landing positions of the samples of each foot. And you see that reliably, at least some of them will discover where the next stone is and therefore make the step go there. We can apply this to the hardware, where we use a fixed map and sample in real time a number of trajectories so that we can cross this gap here. What's interesting is that we have a number of behaviors emerging, for example, stepping on the same stone twice, like here the hind leg, 
or stepping, skipping one stone entirely, again with the hind leg here, which arise naturally from the sampling, but would be very tough to code up manually. So we can explore this discrete footholds. We can also do so in real time, but there's still a small catch because this yellow line, the guiding controls, might not be entirely clear how to get it for every kind of system. And to our rescue comes machine learning. Recall that we learned that it is helpful for reliable sample performing performance to use the feedback control laws. And in fact, there's a theory behind this, which says that the optimal sampler coincides with the optimal policy. So one way to find this optimal sampler is to introduce a parameterized feedback policy, call it a neural network, where we can learn iteratively from past experience through such an update equation here in the second line, which is given from the same theory of path integral control. The learning target of those updates can either be previous samples, in which case we can start this process just from scratch, or we bootstrap ourselves from an existing controls. For example, this feedback control law, which is our benchmark here. So training from this shows that after a couple of hundred iterations, the learned policy manages to outperform the benchmark in terms of average sample performance, albeit at the slightly larger variance as the thickness of this line indicates. So altogether, we've solved the exploration problem through simulating random walks, which strike an automatic trade-off between robustness, safety, and performance. We had two problems created by dimensionality and instability that lead, led to a variance problem of the Monte Carlo estimation. And we addressed them through constraints and guiding controls, which allowed us to apply this in a real-time setting on discontinuous terrain. And if this guiding controller is not known, we can either learn it from scratch or bootstrap ourselves from an existing control, which is much faster. So that's quite now an advancement. But unfortunately, the sampling is quite computationally intense and we have dropped in our MPC rate. And this now takes me to the last work. At this point, we are now enjoying the benefits of an accurate model. We've solved the exploration step, but this has brought us to the limit of computational power. But just from two slides ago, we were motivated by the fact that we can bootstrap ourselves from an existing controller, even if that one is not optimal. So we want to now take this idea all the way and distill a full policy into a neural network, which inherits the capabilities of the first two methods. So learning from optimal control actually brings us a number of nice benefits. First of all, Compared to just running the normal MPC, it is much faster to evaluate. Compared to reinforcement learning, which would be another way to train a neural network policy, we are much more sampling efficient because we don't need to explore everything and rather directly be presented with optimal samples. Compared to learning from other demonstrations, for example, motion capture data from animals, we don't suffer from domain shift and we get demonstrations to respect the constraints of the system that we're interested in. And compared to other student teacher learning setups, we don't have an adaptation to the student in form of a curriculum. And therefore, the demonstrations remain valid throughout the training, also improving sampling efficiency. So, what we did is devise an algorithm we called MPCNet, which acts in an offline and an online phase. In the offline phase, we extract the optimal controls into a neural network policy, where this training data comes from solving the optimal control problem that we've seen in one of the two methods above. Then online, we just deploy this neural network on the robot, which is of course much, fa much faster than solving the original optimal control problem. Let's dive a little bit deeper into how this offline phase proceeds. The standard way of training a neural network from demonstrations is behavior cloning, as some of you have might, have, might have heard before. And behavior cloning is based on minimizing a Euclidean distance between the demonstrations and the learned policy where of course here the demonstrations are again given by the optimal control. But this loss function has a number of problems. First, while, this, while we can minimize this with standard machine learning tools, it doesn't really satisfy the constraints because it's indifferent to proposing feasible or unfeasible controls. And also there are some tuning parameters in there of this norm, which are unclear how to address them. But we've already learned that constraints are particularly important for hardware transfer and that legged robots include many constraints, 
So we wanted a cost a loss function that in, that makes explicit use of the constraints. And we didn't have to look too far because the optimal control is a minimizer of the control Hamiltonian, this H, which is a quantity that comes out from the optimal control problem. So our idea was to use this control Hamiltonian as a loss function for our policy search. And this now solves those two problems because control Hamiltonian explicitly encodes all the constraints of the original problem and it doesn't have any additional tuning parameters. That sounds theoretically nice, but let's compare it to the standard behavior cloning benchmark. What we find is that the MPCNet approach is better in terms of constraint violation score and converges faster to a reliable survival rate. And this pays out in form of robustness when we subject both of those policies to unmodeled uneven ground. Also look in the, at the numbers of many of those uneven rounds, we see that the survival rate of our MPC net is close to the MPC teacher and vastly outperforms the behavioral cloning, especially on harder terrains. But actually just minimizing the control Hamiltonian was not even enough to produce those results for our quadrupedal robot. What we needed in addition was a special neural network control structure, which is here a mixture of expert architecture that matches the hybrid nature of the system. The control in this case is a linear combination of the controls proposed by sub expert policies. And the gating network at the bottom here decides which expert should be active at each time and state. Now training this leads to a specialization of the experts where they focus on one specific contact configuration according to the gate. And this has an effect, this, the effect of the specialization is that compared to a multi-layer perceptron, which we trained on the same Hamiltonian loss, we achieve a better constraint violation because each expert can now focus specifically on the constraints that are relevant for its contact phase. What we can do with that now is not only learn policy on a single gate, but train multi-gate policies. So for this, we can generate MPC trotting and static walk data, put them together into policy learning and get this multi-gate policy. Already during the learning process, we see that the multi-gate policy is pretty much on par in terms of performance with the policies trained on a single gate only. But on runtime, as we have now conditioned this network on the gate, we can execute new kinds of behaviors. For example, new gates and new kinds of transitions like this transition between static walk and trot, which was not seen during the training. So overall, putting everything together, we have an efficient policy search algorithm that is robust and constraint satisfactory and requires little tuning. And that solves the computational problem for both of the previous algorithms. And in fact, we can learn from any kind of optimal control that maintains an internal value function representation, which naturally most of them will do. And that brings me towards the end of my presentation. So we've seen now three algorithms that advance the locomotion capabilities of walking robots. For all three, we've verified their performance with hardware experiments, sometimes on multiple robots. And in particular, we've addressed those three problems at the bottom that bring us closer to applying robots in general unstructured environments. In the first work, we developed a modeling approach that captures the realistic contact interactions while remaining fast, and we saw some new behaviors arising that use this accurate model. Then in the second work, we advanced the theme of using accurate dynamics, just now in simulation, and solved the exploration problem through injection of noise, which allowed us to optimize over discontinuous decisions. For example, these stepping stones here. And finally, we addressed the computational aspect of optimal control, where we developed a policy learning algorithm that allowed us to distill the control from an optimal control policy into a neural network. And it, it remained fast, robust, and constraint satisfactory. So coming back to this original story, where we hope that robots will work one day, let's see how our work fits in. So for this first part, we think it will be useful to adapt automatically to slippery ground by using a model that can predict also such low friction scenarios. When we now want to cross gaps, we think it's a good idea to use sampling to explore better step next, rather than having gradients getting stuck. And as we wander off into more remote areas, we think our MPCNet approach will help achieve energy autonomy 
and reduce the dependency on external computation. Where might this continue? So let's attempt a glimpse into the future. And what we think is that both MPCNet and the Stochastic Planner are within reach to con be conditioned on perceptive data, like a height scanner, for example, that would add them a predictive element rather than just trying to be as reactive and robust to unmodeled variations. And while our results were rather specific to walking robots or quadrupeds even, our methods were in fact quite general. And we think that many of the same ideas like modeling, contacts and exploration will also be applicable to other domains and might be a especially good fit for in-hand manipulation tasks like the one on the bottom right. At this point, I'd like to thank a number of people that made this work possible. First of all, my committee, Marco, Marco, Scott and Rene some of whom who have joined from far away. My colleagues at RSL, who made this a very enjoyable and lively workplace over the years. The students who I had the pleasure of working with and supervising, some of whom have become colleagues by now. The organizations on the right-hand side for their financial support, and my friends and family for supporting me throughout this time. Thank you.